everybody. Thank you for this honor. I certainly feel like I haven't done anything to deserve it. Thank you students for listening to me and colleagues. I know you're all very tired. Thank you musicians for lifting us up. Thank you Mr. Fogg, Mrs. Melkonian who planned this assembly, and Dr. Carter for giving me a chance to share some reflections on Thanksgiving. In bird watching, there's an event called a big year. It's a calendar year when you challenge yourself to spot as many species as possible. A big year is a deeply personal commitment, but it's also a competitive event. And birders, people whom we think of as gentle, nature-loving, hippy-dippy folks who sit and watch and wait in a bird's habitat, they let their ambitions and spirits soar in a big year. They try to top their own and others' bird lists. Often a big year evolves into a nearly spiritual quest, and birders invest their time and treasure and talents to spot the desired species. Their families and friends are pulled in too, and they invest their patience and resources because frankly, a birder in the midst of a big year is not much good for anything other than birding. And a big year seldom satisfies a birder's passion. Instead, it inspires her and helps her to set her future bird watching goals. Well, last year, I had a kind of big year. Though I'm barely a birder, and I didn't choose it, I lived through a year that challenged my body, mind, and spirit, my family, friends, and even my dog. It was a year that left me transformed and definitely renewed. My big year preoccupied me before it occupied me, and I'm still thinking about it, even though that year is officially over. It turned into a big year when my cardiologist, my heart doctor, told me that this was the year to fix my congenital heart defect. Now much heart dysfunction comes down to a question of electric impulses and clear flexible piping to let that blood go through. And cardiac surgeons even refer to themselves as electricians or plumbers. Well, I needed a plumber. For most of my life, I had known that open heart surgery lay ahead. They found this defect when I was three. But I had also hoped that I would be the miraculous exception to cardiac statistics. But of course, that wasn't the case. So when last year became my big year, I was frankly pretty darn scared. I was thankful that I had a chance to be healed, but I was also frightened that this year would involve pain, debilitation, and maybe even my death. Last year, I worried for seven months. I meditated, prayed, exercised as much as I could, but I was crabby and I was spacey a lot of the time. To my students, I'm sorry. <laughs> At the end of winter term, I told my students not to worry and that they'd have a great spring with Ms. Fetter, which they did. And then, early on March 12th, I called up my daughter in Seattle to make her feel better. And then a nurse wheeled me into pre-op at Boston's Brigham and Women Hospital. I gave my two rings to my son and my husband to wear until I could put them back on, and I promised them that I would. And then I drifted into a deep, anesthetized sleep. The brilliant Dr. Gregory Cooper got to work on my plumbing, replacing my misshapen aorta valve, and trimming and sewing my heart to let the blood flow freely through my chambers and arteries. This operation lasted about nine hours, and waking up fully took about another 12 hours. But when I woke up, I felt surprisingly comfortable. I was hooked up to a lot of machines. There was a lot of beeping and buzzing in my room. But my husband, who's been my best friend since I was 17, that's a long time, was right there beside me. And doctors and nurses were with me for the next 12 days, nearly nonstop. 
And then I went home. I went home to my house, a beautiful New Hampshire spring, many, many weeks of loving care from my family, my friends, notes and loving messages from my remarkable colleagues and students at Dairy Field, and miles and miles of slow walks with my old dog, Oliver. So I guess you can see by now, it was a really big year. And I feel humbled and deeply grateful for all of the healing and support that came to me in this year. But of course, with a little extra time to think and write, I've been wondering about the thankfulness that I'm feeling. When I say that I'm grateful, am I really saying anything meaningful? Am I just saying I'm happy because it all turned out as I'd hoped? Because I'm still alive and feeling pretty strong? Well, that's part of it. I'm sure of that. And being thankful also might suggest that I recognize I didn't control many of these outcomes. Other people and powers helped me get from there to here. So thank you means I appreciate them, and that seems like an, a healthy impulse, right? But still, being who I am, I worry that sometimes thank you carries with it a kind of comparing or separating power, an unspoken implication that we're really just glad we're not experiencing other uncomfortable circumstances. For example, I'm so grateful that I have a healthy heart and body now and that I'm not sick like I used to be. Or, I'm so grateful that I'm not as sick as some other patients I've seen. To me, this kind of thankfulness is a different thing. And it doesn't seem quite so kind or healthy. Actually, this kind of thankfulness seems pretty selfish and self-serving. Now, I'm not saying that all gratitude is just gloating. I'm not saying that. But I do think that thankfulness and self-satisfaction roost in the same trees. We can be so relieved and satisfied that we feel very comfortable. And that's when gratitude makes me nervous, when our thankfulness is focused more on ourselves than on others. Does gratitude protect us from those people whose circumstances are undesirable? Or does it help us to hold those people and those situations close in our minds? Does genuine gratitude suggest that we're separate from those people who are sick, poor, and struggling? I don't think so. But here's what I think my big year has shown me. Some thankfulness is self-referential. I'm so thankful for my situation. But there's a deeper kind of gratitude in which we're thankful to and for others, not because of what they do for us, but simply because of who and what they are. I think that gratefulness, gratefulness for others can help us recognize the goodness in our own lives without separating us from those who aren't experiencing it. Wise people seem to agree that thankfulness is important and good when it helps us to see the world and its people more fully and to see how we fit into the wide world. When we're genuinely thankful, we strengthen the connections we have to other people, whether they're suffering or joyful. Being thankful, in a sense, widens our pipes. During my weeks in intensive care, I became aware of a long-term patient there, a man named James Corelli. Now, Mr. Corelli was a science teacher from Braintree High, and he and his wife were there at the Brigham to save his life. As his heart was failing, Mr. Corelli's surgical team, electricians and plumbers, implanted a mechanical heart to keep him alive until a transplant heart could be found for him. He lived at the Brigham for eight months, and just last month, only weeks after he finally received his transplant, Mr. Corelli died. But back in March, when I was there, from my hospital bed, I heard Mr. Corelli before I saw him. I could hear his external pump coming down the hall. Chunk, 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 chunk. You could hear it coming, getting louder and louder. And several times a day, he would slowly pass by my doorway. First, I'd see the nurse pulling his IV pole, then the garden cart that carried the machinery, 
then a nurse's aide pushing that cart, then Mr. Corelli and his wife, and he was usually talking and sometimes laughing. He walked those halls to keep his life going, moving forward, not sitting still, even while he was waiting, just waiting. He kept himself and those around him strong, positive, and thankful. Of course, I knew as soon as I saw him that this man was having a much bigger year than I was, that even a month after his February surgery, he was still waiting for a heart that would let him go home. But as he passed by my door, I didn't feel that separating kind of thankfulness. I wasn't walking in his shoes. I didn't, uh, uh, my heart condition was much easier to cure than his. Instead, I felt a connecting thankfulness. I really wasn't thinking much about my situation, but I felt really thankful that he was there and doing well right then in that moment. And I was grateful for Mr. Corelli's courage and his determination, his positivity, his love of life. He made me thankful and more aware of the amazing technology around and now inside of me and the care and love that surrounded us both. So since my big year, I'm pretty sure that we all have a natural urge to say thank you or something that means thank you when we sense goodness in our lives. And it's not just good manners or self-satisfaction. Thankfulness has something to do with our heart plumbing, with the pipes that connect us to each other and to the rest of the world. Thank you opens us up to both goodness and the trouble in the world. If we are thankful, we won't look aside, but we will see pain as well as joy, and we may also be inspired to address it. If we recognize the source of our thankfulness as another person, then we thank the person. And if we believe that God is the source of this goodness, then we thank God. But we can say a sincere, meaningful thank you, even if we don't know whom or what we're thanking. Thank you ties us to the world outside ourselves, and it helps us to see clearly. Thank you expands your pipes. It opens you up, both to the good and the bad and it keeps us all connected. Thank you.